All right. Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you all tonight. I'm glad to be here. Um, I don't do this a lot. The, the only other time I've done this presentation is to a bunch of high school students. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. Um, but hopefully you'll get something out of it. Um, there's going to be a few technical things at the front end that I feel like I have a responsibility to cover. I feel like I can't talk about my creative process or even my images unless I talk about some of these things first. So it may seem a little dry or a little boring, hopefully not too bad, uh, but that'll be a foundation uh, for the rest of the presentation. Uh, again, most of this is about kind of how I do things. I'm not up here to tell you that this is the way. <laughs> I'm here to tell you this is the way I do it. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I've had some success with it. Um, so it's working for me. So maybe you'll get something out of it too. All right. Oh, and if you have questions, I, you know, we, we may run out of time before I run out of presentation. So, so if you have questions, feel free to interrupt, you know, raise your hand, scream at me something, and I'd be happy to entertain your questions as we go along. I know sometimes it's hard to remember your question at the end of the presentation. So I'm happy to address those as we go through it. All right. All right, so our agenda tonight is uh, I'm going to talk about me for hopefully just a minute. Uh, then we're going to talk about light, composition, subject, purpose, and what I call making the magic, uh, which is really what we're trying to get to at the end of the day, right? We're not trying to take photographs. We're trying to make something special, and that's always my goal. So I've been doing photography professionally in some capacity for 38 years. Um, I like to have a little fun with myself. I don't take myself too seriously, as you can see by my self-portrait. Uh, that's Bob, my flamingo. He lives in my yard. Um, I, I like flamingos, so what, what can I say? Um, but um, yeah, I started out uh, right out of college. I didn't graduate. I, I took a photography class my fourth year in college, and it like everything clicked for me. And I was like, I'm sick of school. You don't need a degree to be a photographer here and I you know not knowing what else to do I, I went and started working at a one-hour photo lab and that was my first professional experience as a photographer is working in a photo lab uh, but all the important things I learned were from other photographers I was a freelance assist well I worked at a catalog house which is where I learned how to do uh, lighting and still life photography and then I did freelance I was a freelance assistant in Dallas, and I worked for all kinds of different photographers. So I learned how to do all kinds of different photography, uh, from fashion to architecture and everything in between. Uh, I would say that my professional forte was product photography. I did a lot of catalog work. I was uh, known for shooting Barbies, and <laughs> as odd as that sounds, but uh, there were several iterations of the JCPenney Christmas catalog where I shot every single Barbie. Uh, Ken or, you know, any variety of it in those catalogs. And um, I, I, I learned the magic of making them stand up. And that earned me the honor of the Barbie photographer. Because they, they don't stand up, right, by themselves. <laughs> but I, I figured out a trick. Um, and then I've done all kinds of stuff. I, I've been accused of being a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I've done project management. I've, I, the, the, you know, I'd spent 10 years teaching at Frisco High School. Uh, had a furniture business for three years. Um, I've done all kinds of stuff. And now I do real estate. My, my, my two, when I'm not doing photography, I'm doing real estate and vice versa. And I love them both. Photography is obviously more fun. If I can make a full-time living doing what I'm doing right now with my photography, that's all I would do. I would just dispense with the real estate. But anyway, um, I was a corporate employee. I forgot. I worked at, at EDS, uh, which then became HP for 10 years. I uh, started out doing multimedia development for them. Uh, they, they decided I had leadership qualities, so they promoted me to manager. I managed a small technical team. I know enough technology to be dangerous, so they let, let me lead smart people <laughs> that know what they're doing. Uh, and that was fun. And then I got into project management, which was not fun, uh, terribly boring. And uh, eventually I, they, they let me go. So I was happy about that. And then I went and taught for 10 years and, and that was fun. Um, 
what else? So my my kind of my saying or my my mantra is uh, common things become uncommon when the artist supplies their vision. Reality becomes forced into a new perspective, leaving the viewer to interpret art on their own terms. And I believe that even though I have a vision as an artist, uh, it's really up to each individual that sees my art to interpret it for themselves. I, I don't believe that I'm imposing a vision upon them. Uh, it's always open to interpretation by others. And I think that's one of the, what makes art interesting, honestly. All right, so we have to talk about light. We can't talk about photography without talking about light uh, because light is uh, your foundational creative material if you're doing photography. <clears throat> so light has two primary characteristics. There's color and intensity or brightness. Uh, the two main types of light that we work with are daylight and incandescent. Um, there are other types of light, obviously, we all know that, like these are different, these neither, these are neither <laughs> in this room, uh, but typically we're either working in some form of daylight or some form of incandescent, and I don't honestly don't like to shoot in any other type of environment, uh, like these lights do not give you pretty results, right, so I can work with daylight and get good results, and I can work with an incandescent light and get good results, everything else is trouble basically as far as I'm concerned um, intensity and brightness you know white black pretty basic a uh, little more nerdy stuff here uh, color temperature is uh, expressed in terms of Kelvin which is uh, color temperature and uh, incandescent is basically 2000 to 3000 Kelvin cool white is 3100 to 4500 and then daylight is 4600 to 6500 and you see there's a range, right? And one incandescent light may be 22,000 Kelvin, another one may be 2,800 Kelvin. And you visibly, you can't tell a lot of difference just with your eye, but the camera will see the difference. So you have to be aware of that, right? Same thing with daylight, right? In the middle of the day, like on a sunny day, you're probably looking at 6,500 Kelvin. But in the morning, it's warmer. In the evening, it's warmer. We all heard about the, the golden hour, right? That's going to be a warmer version of daylight. And of course, your shadows are going to be blue. They're going to be more daylight colored, and where, whereas your, your uh, golden sunshine is going to be more incandescent colored, right? So anyway, again, just something that as a photographer, you need to understand the concept, right? Uh, intensity and brightness. Everything is on a grayscale from total white to total black. Um, uh, it's really basically measured in lux. Uh, and when you're looking at like camera equipment, it's uh, dynamic range is what you want it, what you're interested in. So dynamic range is really the, 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 how many stops of brightness that camera can capture, okay? The more bright, the more stops of brightness it can capture, the better the camera, in my opinion, right? So, because because you get better, you get more detail in your whites and more details in your blacks, right? So the contrast, so let's say if you have a camera that has ten stops of brightness uh, versus thirteen stops, the one with thirteen stops, you're going to get more detail in your whites and more details in your blacks. That's why it matters. Um, what are you really photographing? You're really photographing light. You're not photographing the subject. And I think this is where most people go wrong uh, with their photography is they're so focused on the subject that they don't look at the light. And what your image is, what your camera is really capturing is the light reflecting off that subject. And that makes all the difference, right? It completely changes uh, the mood and what you're trying to communicate with that photograph based on how the light is is hitting the camera sensor, right? Um, so when I'm looking at an object, I mean, obviously I'm interested in the subject, but my primary concern is how is the light interacting with that subject, right? Uh, if I change the angle of the camera, what does that do to the light, right? So I always think of it as in terms of the light reflecting off the subject as opposed to I'm taking a picture of this table or whatever, right? Uh, controlling light, there's three basic mechanisms in a camera that control light. Uh, the first one is a ISO or ASA, and it's a light sensitivity of the sensor. It used to be the film, right? Film speed was what it used to be. 
I used to have 100 speed film, 200 speed film, 400 speed film. That is carried over into the digital world. It's still expressed that way. Um, but that is how sensitive the, the camera is to the light. So the lower the number, the lower the sensitivity, the higher the number, the higher the sensitivity, right? So at a 100 ASA, you're, if you take a picture at night, you're gonna get black. Okay, pretty much. No matter what you, what other what other camera settings you have, you're pretty much going to get black. Uh, at 3200 ASA, you're going to get an image, right? Uh, and there's the whole range in between. So that's one of your uh, ways that you adjust. Now, the important thing about ASA is it affects quality. Okay, the lower the ASA, the higher quality your image is going to be. The higher the ASA the more grain you're gonna have. That's an old term as well. We don't really have grain in digital images, but in film we did. So we still kind of talk about it that way. So your sharper image is gonna be at 100 ASA, not so sharp at 6400, right? Then f-stop, f-stop controls how much light actually hits the sensor, right? So that's another way to control it. The other thing about f-stop is it controls depth of field, right? So the lower the number, the less depth of field, the higher the number, the more depth of field. In other words, how much stuff is in focus, right? And it also matters how close you are to the subject. So there's a lot to think about on this one because it not only affects how much light comes in, but it affects how much of how much of the scene is in focus. And depending on how close you are, or what kind of lens you're using, that also impacts your depth of field. So again, more things to be considered. And then shutter speed. Uh, is expressed in uh, thousandths of a second or hundredths of a second. Usually most cameras will do 30 second exposures up to like 4,000, but you know, some are better. Some, you know, there's a whole, a whole range in that too. Um, but uh, shutter speeds affects uh, blur, right? So if you have something moving and you shoot it at anything less than a 60th of a second, like a 30th of a second or a 15th of a second, you're gonna get some motion blur, right? Uh, you can mitigate that somewhat by using a tripod. But again, if whatever is in the picture is moving, you're going to get some blur. So, uh, or if you're like shooting something that's moving fast, like a bird flying or a race car, you're going to need a really high shutter speed in order to freeze that image. Okay? But again, all these three, these three things work together to give you a proper exposure. And you always have to manipulate those things in unison to get the result you want. So if you, if you understand all these concepts and you uh, when you look at your subject, you can figure out where you need to be with each of these settings to get the result you want, right? Um, human eye is very subjective. Your brain interprets things significantly more than you even imagine. Uh, you're, when you look at something, your brain is filling in all kinds of gaps. In fact, you've got two eyes, right? So you're seeing in stereo. So literally you have a gap in the middle of your vision and your brain fills that in. I know it's weird, right? But it's true. And it, it, it's like, so it interprets color. So like when you start doing photography a lot, you start seeing color more vividly. And somebody will walk in the room and say, hey, this room looks great. It's really nice and everything. You walk in and go, oh my God, this lighting is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. It's all green. What's, you know, uh, and, but your brain interprets it, right? Your brain adjusts. It not only adjusts focus and depth of field, it adjusts color of light and the whole business. So that's why you need all those other things I was talking about. So you know kind of what's going on. The camera sensor is dumb. It knows nothing. All it does is record the light hitting the sensor, okay? And turns that into to digital information and stores it. Now, some people will say, well, my iPhone 14 is better than the Samsung S20 camera. Well, they might have the same image sensor in them, but it's the software that makes the difference. Because the software in your iPhone or your Samsung phone is interpreting that the data that it gets from the image sensor and changing how it looks, all right? And we're gonna see some examples later on of the difference between this is straight out of camera and this is process, okay? So you'll get some idea of what I'm talking about there. But the, 
the software and the camera kind of does what your brain does in a limited sense. It's not as smart as your brain is, but it interprets the image and changes it, right? So you, that's why the iPhone picture might look better to you than the Samsung picture because of the software, right? All right. Talk a little bit about composition. Composition is the harmonious arrangement of the parts of a work of art in relation to each other and to the whole. That's the way I see it. Uh, rule of thirds, I can't talk about composition without talking about rule of thirds. It's my favorite. There is another thing called, what is the golden rule, Eric? Is, it, is that what it's, they call it? The golden rule or the rule of 16s? Uh, I don't, that's too complicated for me. <laughs> so I just do rule of thirds, all right? And I used to not think about this too much, but once, I, but I, I, I kind of got a different perspective on it and started taking it more seriously, and my photography improved significantly. Um, so let's talk about this. So this is one of my photographs, and this is how I apply the rule of thirds to it. Um, what you're looking for is focal point, and how is the image divided up? So you see in the bottom quadrant, we pretty much have grass and barbed wire. Uh, the top quadrant is mostly sky. Uh, and then the middle is the barn, which is our, our subject, right? Uh, and if you'll notice that one of the lines intersects with the peak uh, on the back of the barn, and the front of the barn peak is right at that other line going, going across, right? So, and then this uh, loop of barbed wire, it's all the way over in the, the right quadrant, right? So again, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this while I'm taking the picture and I actually have this grid in my camera. So I'm always looking at it. Uh, and that's how I use to compose the image. So here's a evening shot of the Frisco water tower. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have a drone. <laughs> yeah, I have a drone. I can't fly, my drone can. Uh, yeah, really tall ladder. But you'll see the, the left, a vertical line goes right directly through the middle of the water tower, and that gives you your focal point. Uh, the The top lateral line is lined up with the top of the water tower. Uh, you'll see the horizon line also lined up with that. Uh, the top third is sky. The bottom two thirds is all ground. So again, that's how I applied the rule of thirds in that one. So here um, we've got the subject in the center, which is the horse, right? Uh, you notice that the pedestal that the horse is on is, is inside of the middle third, uh, the Reunion Towers on the uh, left quadrant, and then the bulk of the building is on the, the right quadrant. I like shooting like weird things. <laughs> I find things like this interesting. Um, yeah, yes, it's, it's, I like I love the texture and the color. I'm, I'm very uh, attracted to textures. Um, but here's the rule of thirds on it. So you can see the bolt is right in the middle of that that right line. Here's a portrait I did a while ago. You can see the the subject is the kid, right? And she's right in the middle of that right line. Uh, the top is mostly black, the faces are in the middle, and then the rest of the image is below. Is a lot of this the result of cropping and matching work? Did no. You know? I, I try very hard to crop in frame when I'm shooting. Um, yeah. It's a lot less work to get it ready to get done. Yeah. And I, I, I well, so, so my, my thing is that if I shoot intentionally thinking I'm going to crop, I'm losing a lot of pixels, right? So the more pixels I lose, the smaller the image is gonna be, which means I can't enlarge it any bigger, right? So I, I wanna be able to enlarge the image as big as I want, uh, or as big as it's, the camera is able to, to give me the, the quality. And anytime you're cropping in, you're losing pixels. So you can't, you can't go as big with it, right? So I always try to crop in camera. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that I don't ever crop because I do, right? And sometimes I shoot it and then at later when I'm processing and I'm like, oh man, I, you know, I kind of missed it, right? So I recrop it, right? Uh, but here's the rule of thirds. 
So my focal point on this one was the, uh, the left eye. Uh, and then you've got the main on both sides and then the center of the face in the middle, pretty much. Uh, this is one of my favorite shots. I love perspective shots. Uh, this is the a railroad bridge uh, across the Red River. And uh, here's the rule of thirds. You can see the focal point is the rail going right down the middle of the, the, the scene. Uh, um, I like doing macro stuff. I need to do more of it. But I like one of my favorite things about photography is showing things to people that you don't normally see. Like you don't normally see this view, right? Because they're moving too fast and you can't get that close. Uh, but here's the rule of thirds. So everything's like the main focus is right in that middle scene. And then the top and the bottom are just background. Now, with this particular shot, if the background had had focus in it, I think it would have ruined it uh, to me. I mean, it would have taken so much attention away from the dragonfly that you wouldn't see it anymore. Uh, and that's why I did it this way intentionally. Now, this one's a little weird. Um, it's kind of, <laughs> I mean, it's there, but it's like hard to explain the rule of thirds on this one, but to me it works. Uh, and sometimes you break the rules, right? I mean, sometimes the perspective is cool and you like it and you shoot it anyway, and it still works, even though it may not technically completely comply with the rule of thirds, right? Uh, so the summary is that the purpose of composition is to get the viewer to focus on what you want them to see. That's really it. Uh, the rule of thirds just helps you do that. Okay? So the point is always to get them to focus on what you want them to see. The subject is your main objective. The subject can be anything you want, providing you can successfully draw the viewer's attention to it. So this is a squirrel. <laughs> My wife loves squirrels, so I take pictures of squirrels. Uh, this one was actually runner up at the uh, State Fair Photography Contest uh, last year. Um, and what I love about it is the, the pose, right? So it was like 110 degrees that day. So this squirrel was just trying to cool off, right, in the shade. Um, but that's why I love this picture. There's the rule of thirds. Um, little Photoshop magic here. Uh, this was also a runner up in the state fair competition or an honorable mention. And um, I like corny dogs. And so I decided Big Tech needed a corny dog. So um, I gave him one. <laughs> and I, I defy you to tell that it's not real. <laughs> but again, rule of thirds, so you got big text on one vertical and then the corner. It's not perfect, but it's close, close enough. Uh, this is a door of doors. Uh, this is real. This is not manipulated in any way other than adjusting the lighting and color. Uh, this really exists. It's a, literally a, a giant door that they put all these other doors on in Dallas, and I thought it was cool, and some other people have too. Um, and then again, the rule of thirds really wears the rule. We don't know, <laughs> but it looks good. Um, this is a little detail. I love detail shots. Um, this is, to me, this is just kind of an abstract composition of light and color, or not really color, but light and darkness. And rule of thirds, we got the subject in the center, which is in focus, the foreground and background are out of focus. There you go. Uh, Longhorn picture, obviously we know what the subject is, right? Uh, and all the actions happening right there in the middle, right? The purpose, what's the point? So um, you always have to ask what the story is, right? I think in my mind, every image has a story. Uh, if it doesn't have a story, it's missing something. Um, uh, it can be simple or complex. It doesn't really matter what it is as long as it has one. Right? So what do y'all think the story is here? This is a Q and a, this is an interactive part where you get to tell me things. So what do you think the story is here? Fun. Fun, yeah, good. Good answer. The corner that blows me away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Statue of Liberty. Yeah. This is a shot of the State Fair. That's a ride. It's a, like a right. Yeah, but it's cool. Right, it it, it kind of draws your attention, doesn't but it? The arc is imposed onto the picture. Yeah, yeah. Well, I call this circle of joy uh, because the ride spins right. It's the circle, and 
if you could look closely at the faces, you would see the joy, right? And that's what I love about it is the, the detail on their faces. Yeah, no fear, right? Oh, and, and this was uh, this one first place in the State Fair Black and White Professional Division. So pretty, and I, I won a, a, another award at uh, an art show too. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah, there's a little hand up at the top. You can barely see it. It's cropped a little bit, but there's this hand sticking down. That's my favorite part. That's why I picked this one. Uh, but what's the story here? Blue bonnets. Spring. Good. Renewal. Yeah, all those. You're all correct. Yeah, I'll call it uh, uh, blue bonnets forever because it just the field just kind of goes on forever, and then the clouds kind of pick up the uh, the purple in the in the flower, the blue in the flowers. What about this one? Ooh, you've been there. Confinement, yeah. This, to me, this is kind of a scary picture and I like it because of that. Um, this, the color is manipulated on this, but not significantly. It really looks like that. So the deal is, is that in the middle, you've got the, all these skylights letting in the blue daylight, right? And then inside the cells, it's all incandescent light. And to me, it's, it's like hell. Hell's in the cells and heaven's outside. So. Alcatraz prison in San Francisco. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, like I said, I, I I brought out the a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But you're not going to see that much difference. Because your brain says, "Well, I know that's light, and I know that's light." So they probably look almost the same instead of seeing stark difference between the two different sorts of light. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Because I, when I took the picture, I didn't really see it like this. Because, like Eric said, my, my 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 brain was compensating for the difference in light color. But when I saw the image later on the computer, it really it caught my attention. I'm like, oh, I need to go with that, and so I did. So, what's the story here? <laughs> Well, that's urban decay. Urban decay. That's it. That works. But I, I like this because of the uh, mural of Jimi Hendrix uh, painted on the side of the building. This was uh, shot in Haight Ashbury in San Francisco. And yeah, I like the it kind of harks back to the 60s and some urban decay. And um, I did, if you, you can't, you probably can't tell, but I actually made the sky black and white. So there's actually no color in the sky. It was already a gray cloudy day. And I decided to take that another step further and actually make it black and white, whereas the rest of the image is color. Yeah. Yeah, the skull and crossbone flag in the window. Yeah, there's a lot here to take in for sure. What about this one? Other than I like trains, what's the story? Power. Yeah. 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 The complexity of mechanical things, the power of steel, uh, the power of big machines. That's what I was trying to capture with it. This is a drone shot. This isn't a tall ladder shot. <laughs> it's actually a drone. What's the story? Huh? What was that? Oh, thank you. So this is to me, it's just it's just beautiful, right? I mean, it's just sometimes it's just beautiful, right? And that's okay, that's enough. You know? What about this one? Yeah. So this is due on a leaf of a bush. And this is one of the things that when you look at the bush, you like you see the color of the leaf. And you see that it looks kind of fuzzy, but you don't really see it, right? But when you see the macro shot of it, you not only see the coolness of the, the water droplet, but you see the little spiky things that make it look fuzzy. They're really not fuzz, it's spikes, little it's spiky image. things. And when you're photographing, you don't see the image inside the drop. Then, right, then yeah. When I take shots of water droplets, I'm looking, what am I going to find in yeah. the drop? Yeah, sometimes it's a happy find, sometimes it's not so happy. Yeah. Can we do photographs? 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, that goes back to, you know, a steady hand, a special lens. You have to have a special lens to take a photograph like this. And, you know, depth of field, right? F-stop and all those factors that we talked about initially, about controlling all those factors. Right? If you're shooting up that close, I don't care what F-stop you're shooting at, you're not going to get you got a sixteenth of an inch. Yeah, yeah, theater, right? yeah, yeah. It's one of the frustrating things about mac macro photography. This is this is probably f eleven, which normally gives you a bunch of depth of field, and I've got barely any. Right. F eleven. Yes. There's also a pair of the toe. Yes. 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 So what's the story here? I need <laughs> <laughs> well, I call this freedom awaits. This is the uh, door that leads to the exterior of Alcatraz prison. And again, the texture in the door is what caught my eye. And I stood there and waited until there were no people to get the shot. And um, you can see that actually, I don't know if you can see it up there, but the, you can see the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. And so that's why I call it freedom awaits, because it's like, from the inside of the prison out. Were you not stunned by how beautiful that island is? Yeah, it is beautiful. Lots of things. I mean, I took a ton of pictures there. And it was pretty cool. So what's the story here? What is it? No, this is in Texas. Yeah, yeah. That's really, I mean, where they really caught my eye here was all the doors. I don't know if you, how well you can see them, but it's a whole row of doors, empty doors. And then at the end, you've got the green forest, right? So to me, it was, it kind of, it represented the, all the choices we make in life, right? We've got all these doors that we can choose to go through. Um, and at the end of the day, we hope to get to a better place, right? Again, the texture, I love the texture. So making the magic. So my favorite quote is from Robert Kappa, who was a famous war photographer. He actually died in combat. Uh, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. If your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. And I, I try to live by that. I'm, <laughs> I am uh, guilty of ripping out the telephoto lens. <laughs> but I do, it, it, it reminds me that I need to go the extra step to get the image and not be lazy about it. That's what it reminds me of. Don't be lazy about it. Um, but this is basically my essential steps when I'm, I'm doing photography. I imagine the scene oftentimes before I go somewhere to take a picture, I will have thought about it, even imagine what I want to get when I get there. Now, does that always happen? No. In fact, sometimes I get something much better than I had planned to get. Uh, but that's part of the fun, right? But I always start with kind of picturing in my mind what I want to photograph. Um, then you use your technical knowledge and creativity to technically capture the image, you know, with composition and all the other things we've talked about. Uh, apply basic adjustments to the image. So I shoot what I call a flat profile. In other words, I, 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 I bump up the, uh, the shadows and bring down the highlights in my camera settings. So that um, it when you just look at the basic image, it looks a little flat. So I, but I, it gives me the information I need to do what I want with blacks and whites. So it works for me. So I start with basic adjustments, just color, contrast, and cropping. Um, I'm not above removing or modifying things in the image. Uh, I'm not a documentary photographer. I'm a creative photographer. So if I don't like that sign in the shot, I will take it out. <laughs> Or whatever. To, to again, it's all about uh, communicating what I want to communicate. And if something's distracting about that, then I don't have a problem with taking it out. Um, enhance the image to achieve your artistic vision. So uh, we're going back to camera sensors, right? They're dumb, right? 
they don't see things the way my eye sees them. So my end goal is always to show you what I see in my mind when I take the picture. And sometimes that involves some significant enhancement of the original image. And we're gonna see some right now. So this is straight out of the camera. This is no, nothing, nothing done to it, right? Straight out of the camera. Not bad, right? Now this is after I've processed it. Here's another one. So some things to note about here. There's a guy walking out on the right side there. I couldn't get it without people, like too many people, right? This is during the state fair, right? But I love the light, right? So this is the after shot. This is before, this is actually, um, I wanna say an eight second exposure. It was basically dark when I took this picture. It was after sunset. Uh, this is the result. So this is a product that if, you, if you're only shooting JPEG, you will not be able to do this, right? This is a complete um, product of shooting raw, which is means that I'm, I'm not letting the camera process the image. If you shoot JPEG, the camera is going to compress the image the way it sees fit. When you shoot raw, it, you've got a much bigger file, which is bad for storage, but it's good for data. You've got more data to work with. You've got more detail in the black, more detail in the whites, more color information. So you can manipulate it more. Right? This is another shot. This is probably a four or five second exposure. Again, it's after sunset. Um, that's the after. This is pretty heavily manipulated. I, I have a print of this on canvas and everybody thinks it's a painting, um, which I take as a compliment, by the way. <clears throat> this is a drone shot. There's the after. How can you manipulate the drone shot? Well, you, it's just like anything else. I mean, you take the picture and then you, on the computer, you do the manipulation. So, so this is the straight out of the camera. Yeah, and you, you notice like it's cropped. So I didn't like all that, all the roof was just distracting to me. So I did a real skinny crop on it and I made um, everything except the gold and these stripes down there, uh, a sepia tone, a black and white sepia to kind of push it back visually so that you really just see um, what I want you to see, which is the, the bird and the, the gold and the, the red lines. Right? This almost got deleted. <laughs> and then I was like, well, let me see what I can do with this. Right? I was kind of thinking like a painter more than a photographer. And I turned it into this. Yeah. So, so this is what you normally delete because it's terrible, but with a raw file and uh, some creative editing, you can turn it into that. This is a lot of painterly things like dodging and burning little specific areas to bring out different things. This is another drone shot. So I've gotten in this year, this past year, I started getting into more manipulation of images. Uh, I've always loved abstract paintings and I don't paint though. So I wanted to see if I could do something with photography to give me that kind of effect. Now this is obviously you can tell what it is if you look at it for more than five seconds, um, but it is heavily manipulated. Um, I think this is cool, but I felt like most people wouldn't because it's very, brown and monotone, but I love the tree, the fact that it's laying down in this mud and stuff. Uh, and so I did that to it. I call it the ghost tree. And, um, and you know, it's dead, you know, anyway. And this is very extremely, I mean, this is like beyond manipulated, <laughs> All right? Yeah. So um, this is one of my favorite shots, just sunflowers. And I, I went there to get just a beautiful field of sunflowers, but sunflowers are kind of crappy. It was kind of late in the sunflower season and they, were, they weren't looking so good. So uh, this was my plan B and uh, really happy the way it turned out. The sun is directly behind the flower. Uh, 
uh, which is why it's kind of like glowing like that. And I think that's what really makes the image for me. Uh, again, texture, I love texture. I love shape and texture. And, and that's what really draws me to this. And then uh, perspective again, I'm big on perspective. I like leading lines. Um, I almost didn't, uh, I shot this because somebody said, hey, you need to go shoot the silos from Broadway Street. And I'm like, I tried that before and it didn't work. But because they told me that, I went and tried again and I found just the right spot with just the right lens. And then, you know, God came through for me and gave me the sunset and it all came together. Um, I did do some retouching on this because there were some things in, on the side of the road that I was not fond of. Um, but not that you would ever know, right? And then this, this is a pretty straight out of camera. Uh, this is obviously a time exposure. I think it's like 20 seconds. Um, the blue, the blue and red lights dashing across those are courtesy of the Dallas Police Department. Uh, there happened to be some kind of big incident happening nearby, and they just happened to grace my camera lens while I was there. That's uh, the old stop that was that yes yeah i did i did um so this was originally shot in color I, everything i shoot is in color and then i made it black and white um i did do add kind of a vignette to it to bring your eye to the center and i actually lightened um the road and that very the the circle at the very end i lightened those trees again to draw your eye to the center perspective you know you don't normally see a blue bonnet from the top so i had to shoot it from the top <laughs> and to me it just it's geometric right it's a geometric design and i love that <clears throat> so this is one of my new things that i've tried to do and i call this radiance because it reminds me of the sun uh, the sunset or sunrise um, this is actually an aerial shot of a the blue is actually a little stream and all the other things are plants and things. And so very heavily manipulated and actually doubled. So if you split it in half, one side is the actual image. And then I doubled it to get this kind of radiant, you know, look. But have you ever wanted to take up Some do, yeah. 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 I'm still trying to get good at photography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in conclusion, you're the critical component. It's not about the camera, right? Uh, cameras and computers are just tools. It's how you use them that make the difference. Um, they only create art if you show them how. Uh, and no two photographs are exactly alike, which is what I love about photography is two people could be in the same place, same time, and their, their photographs will be different, right? Um, all humans are creative, so it's in your nature. Uh, I really believe that. Uh, you can choose to use it or not. You can choose to channel it in any direction you want, whether it's painting or photography or drawing or building things or carpentry or whatever, right? That's up to you. Uh, these are the two primary desktop, desktop applications I use. I do use others, but these are the use, ones I use the most. Those are Adobe Photoshop and Skylum Aurora HDR. Uh, these are some phone apps. I use the Snapseed. So if you're doing stuff on your phone, you can do a lot of things with your phone image uh, using these tools. Uh, I like Snapseed. It's got a lot of options. It might probably be confusing to non photographers, but it's it's good. Uh, these others are fine too. They're all these are all free. And then some online photo editors. If you don't want to buy Photoshop, but you want to start playing with uh, pictures then all four of these uh, will work. I've used Pixlr a lot. Um, I don't like any of them better than Photoshop because I know Photoshop pretty well, but they all work. Uh, any questions? Yes. What kind of camera do you have on your phone? Do you put your camera on or something? No, when I first got into drones, I bought a drone that I could do that with and had terrible problems. It never really worked. Um, it was years ago, so that was part of the problem. But anyway, no, my I I my I have a DJI uh, Mini Pro Three, which is one of their new ones, 
It's really small. That's why I love it because I can take it anywhere, everywhere, all the time if I want to. Um, and um, it's got its own camera on it. So that's one of my one of my pet peeves about uh, uh, prosumer drones is they don't they 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 all gear it towards video and not still. Like the best camera you can get is a 20 megapixel camera, and I'm like, you can't do better than that. I know you can, you just don't want to. But it's they're all, all they think about is video. So this one has an effective 48 megapixel. Yes, and it's good. It is good. That's what I use all the time. I use that iteration of it because it's a 12 megapixel sensor, but they do their computer hoodoo voodoo magic in the background to create a 48 megapixel file. And it's good. It's not as good as a Sony A7R4, right? With a 50 megapixel full image sensor, but it's good. It's 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 as good or better than a 20 megapixel still camera. Two weeks I'm taking it Huh? Two weeks I'm taking it Oh, cool! Awesome! Awesome! A drone class. A drone class. Yeah. So if you have questions about drones or cameras or anything, I mean, I've I've, I've done some research on. Your yeah, you can. You can. Uh, you can crash them. Uh, you can lose them. There's all kinds of. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't tried that one yet. Because <laughs> that's. I try not to do illegal things. Yeah. Well, you. You technically, it's it's illegal to fly a drone in the national park. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. They. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we haven't found, we haven't tried to find out yet, but yeah, I try to fly legally at all times. I do have a, my Part 107 license, so I can fly professionally and commercially. Um, I'm a trained drone pilot. Yeah, but it's it's. I'll tell you that uh, as a photographer flying a drone, it's a lot harder to get good pictures because you're you've got a lot more to deal with mentally. So with my camera, when I'm on the ground taking pictures, I can kind of just zone out on everything and focus on the photography. And that's all I think about when I'm doing it. I'm like a zombie walking around, right? Uh, which is that I, well, I don't really like shooting groups because people talk to me and I'm like, I'm busy. You know? <laughs> uh, then with the drone, you've got this extra component of safety and where I'm in the sky and what's around me. Is there an airplane coming? Is there a helicopter? You know, is somebody going to run over me while I'm standing here? You know, all that stuff, you got a whole lot of, a whole nother set of problems that you have to be conscious of uh, while you're flying the drone, trying to get the shot. And you're also working in three dimensional space, whereas on the ground, you're pretty much two dimensional, right? You are, uh, even though the world's not. But with the drone, you got three dimensions to work with. And to me, it adds a lot of complexity. So I'm still feel like I'm working on getting good at it. Um, yeah. You have your drone up there. How do you know what you're taking? Uh, yeah, I've got a screen on my controller where I, I control the drone. I've got a screen uh, that shows me what the camera sees. Yes. Yeah. And I can adjust the settings and everything. I can, you know, change the exposure, the shutter speed, all that stuff while I'm flying it. But again, your your <laughs> level of complexity is, you know, up there a little bit, at least for me. I don't know. Some people maybe. Oh yeah, oh yeah, but that's another thing you have to learn what it does in auto mode. Like, like my drone tends to overexpose a little bit, um, especially in challenging lighting situations. I mean, when it's uh, you know daylight and normal, it does great. But if it's a little dark or cloudy or something, it tends to overexpose. So I tend to I have to compensate for that. Yeah, yeah, and I usually shoot JPEG and RAW. Every now and then, a blue moon. I actually like the JPEG better, but I almost always use the raw image. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, I have. I have to tell you, it's a nice here. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, who knew you get all this? I mean, I know that you're bigger, qualified, and established, and you know, but wow, I think the variety. Wow, I get to see here. Landscape shots yeah. and very good. You need to have a humor. Look at Barbie dolls. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Barbie dolls. Um, well, I mean, I know a lot of people have like want to learn technical things, and I, I don't do a technical presentation because 
your phone's different from his phone and his camera is different from her camera. And they all have different menus and different settings. And it's almost like you've, in order to learn the, the nitty gritty technical stuff uh, on, your, on your equipment, you have to know the system. Um, that's why I don't really do a presentation on that. I could do a thing on lighting. Uh, that can be pretty genericized, but um, like Penny and I have talked lighting a couple of times. But, yeah. <laughs> so any other questions? Oh, thank you. Um, and then jumping on that bit, I was in that, maybe that, you know, your joy. Oh, thank you. So, I mean, will we actually furnish your store? No way. Oh, no. Oh, no. So, I just appreciate your Oh, thank you. I do want to add that I grew up in West Texas. I grew up in Abilene. Uh, and that really has shaped my creative vision, so to speak in that it taught me to see the beauty in things that most people don't think are beautiful. Because you've ever been to Abilene, it's like flat mesquite trees, brown. I mean, those people are like, oh, this is the ugliest place I've ever seen. Uh, but as a photographer, you find the beauty in it and you figure out how to show other people that beauty. And I, I feel like that's really helped me in my, my photography journey. And I, I love everything Texas. I come up, you know, I, I, I shoot Texas stuff, you know, grain silos and, you know, if you look at my stuff on Facebook, you'll see Texas stuff, you know, because it, it draws me, it appeals to me, right, as a, as a native Texan. So, yeah, you, Eric gets it, you know. I'm always jealous of him because he's always wandering on Big Ben and I want to be out there. Yeah. Yeah. What other questions? Any? I think we're about out of time. But. I think we're good. Oh, we are. Yeah. Are we up till 8.30? So I can keep talking. <laughs> but I, I do want to say one thing and then I'll just stop. All right. And then we can do whatever. Um, equipment doesn't matter, but it does. Okay. And let me clarify that. Um, I've, I've kind of to simplify it to its simplest form. If you spend less than eight or nine hundred dollars on a camera body, you're wasting your money. Right, you need to spend at least that much money on the camera body, and then you need to level that on a lens. The most important thing about the photography equipment is the glass. The lens is everything. It doesn't matter how good the sensor is. If the lens is crappy, what goes on the sensor is going to be crap. So I, I will spend thousands of dollars on a lens to put on an eight hundred dollars camera, and I will get good results. Right, so. It, and it doesn't really, I mean, they're all good. I mean, you know, Canon, Nikon, I shoot Panasonic. I shoot Micro Four Thirds, which is a smaller sensor. I love it because it's small and light and it's not, I mean, I used to shoot Nikon and I got tired of carrying that stuff around. <laughs> it's, it's heavy. Um, but yeah, so it's it's really about how you use the, the gear, not so much what it is, because um, all the major brands are good. Um, I'm not big on off-brand lenses, though. I'm kind of snobby about that. When I had Nikon, I bought Nikon lenses. And they have their place. They have their place, yes. It's made about $200, yep. $85 millimeters. Yeah, and it works for you, right? It works. Hey. It's pretty picture. It's meant for manual. Okay. Well, if it's good, it's good, right? I mean, again, you know, some people would go, oh, Eric, you, you know, I can't believe you've got that lens. You know, look at my... Well, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, yeah, right, right. But at the end of the day, it comes down to your creative vision and how you use the tools, right? But quality, I mean, quality matters too. I, I've, I've never found, and I've tried, I've never found a point and shoot camera, you know, one with the lens built in and everything that takes a good picture, at least to my, to my standards. Uh, they're just they're just a waste of money. You might as well buy, buy a good phone. You know, if you want to point and shoot, just buy a really good phone. Buy the newest iPhone or the newest Samsung and just do that. David, thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you.